Hi and welcome to episode 29 of Beating BTD, a podcast about body dysmorphic disorder from the BTD Foundation. I'm Claire Atherton and my guest for this episode is the psychotherapist Ari Winograd. The founder and director of the Los Angeles BTD and Body Image Clinic, Ari has dedicated his entire career to treating BTD and as a result has a really deep understanding of the disorder. I found it fascinating to hear his insights, particularly around the interplay between shame and self-identity in BTD. I hope you enjoyed the interview. So, hi Ari, thank you so much for joining us on Beating BDD. How are you today? I'm doing well. Uh, Thank you for having me, Claire. I thought it would be really interesting to start just by hearing um, how many years you've been working with with people with BDD. I've been working with individuals with BDD since the late 1990s, so I guess it's pushing a quarter century now. Mm -hmm. my my entire career as a psychotherapist has been um, working with people with BDD. Actually, my, my career actually started working with individuals with OCD, but that quickly morphed into treating people with BDD, and that's that's been the epicenter of my my professional psychotherapy career. Fantastic. I imagine that's that's a lot of patients and over a quarter of a century, people that you've been able to help. Yeah, I've worked with um, hundreds and hundreds of people with BDD, maybe even more now. Um, but at, you know, at least tens and tens and tens of thousands of hours mm-hmm. of people. I mean, this is what I do: work with BDD all day, every day, and, and this is what I like to do too. Yeah, out of interest, um, are you noticing any increase in the numbers of people who are presenting with BDD to you? I'm just, I'm always interested in that because of the whole social media phenomenon. We hear so much about this in the UK, about the impact on body image of, of that kind of uh, invention. It's an interesting question, Claire. This is my opinion. So we absolutely worldwide are seeing higher incidence of body image dissatisfaction. Mm. So... I look at body image issues existing on a continuum. In fact, I like to look at everything existing on a continuum. And body image dissatisfaction is very, 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 very common worldwide. And, you know, what is body image dissatisfaction? Well, it's someone doesn't like an aspect of their appearance. If we look at the continuum, we start talking about body image disorders. And one of those is obviously BDD, body dysmorphic disorder. If we look further down the continuum, what's the difference? So how I describe it is people with body image dissatisfaction, they don't like an aspect of their appearance, but it's not entangled with their identity. And also, they don't have these constant negative intrusive obsessions about the body part. They don't like it. They may be self-conscious, but that's where it ends. It doesn't change their life. It doesn't change their intimate or interpersonal relationships. They live their life. So... Um, there's definitely a major, major increase in that. In terms of body image disorders and extreme ones such as BDD, uh, it's hard to say. Um, in my opinion, if it was just social media, I mean, everybody on the planet's exposed to the same material now, right, and the same images. But why don't we see a higher incidence? You know, we would have many, 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 many more people with BDD if that was the main cause. So this is an opinion. Again, yes, definitely an increase in body image dissatisfaction in terms of BDD. I don't know for sure. Social media doesn't definitely doesn't help BDD, but there's so many factors behind the etiology of BDD. I, I wouldn't say that that in itself would be the only one. Something I've noticed, I think, is um, slightly confusing is that certain celebrities will throw the term dysmorphic around in relation to things. Actually, when you listen to what they're saying, do sound more like body image dissatisfaction end of the continuum, don't they? And I don't think in a way it's a sort of it's a flip side of a good thing, which is growing awareness of what body dysmorphic disorder is. But it's also confusing because, (laughs) because it's actually not what they're suffering from. I'm glad you brought this up. And let me use this opportunity to clarify um, these terms. So obviously a pop psychology, very hashtag social media word that has been trending for a while and that was body dysmorphia. That is not a diagnosis. That's a pop psychology word term, body dysmorphia. The real term we use is body dysmorphic disorder. And unfortunately, 
Um, just like, for instance, people use, I'm depressed today. You know, maybe it's raining, I'm depressed. Okay. Well, depression kills people, but the term depressed is used all the time. And unfortunately, body dysmorphia has now become that word, that term. Um, so if someone comes out of the media, which is frequently now, and say, I have body dysmorphia, chances are they don't have BDD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do they have some sort of body image issue? Probably. Do they not like an aspect of their parents? Probably. But obviously with BDD, shame is one of the key emotions. And many people with BDD, A, don't even think or know they have BDD. They think they're just deformed or ugly or misshapen. But even if they think they have BDD, there's a lot of shame around the diagnosis. So again, this isn't 100%, but anybody who comes out and says they have body dysmorphia, I doubt they have BDD. Could they have it? Maybe. But most of the time, they're using that trending hashtag mm -hmm. word. And I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Body dysmorphia is not a diagnosis. That's a really uh, helpful clarification, actually. Thank you. So with all of that experience and over the years, the number of patients yeah. you've treated, you must have noticed some, I presume, some common themes emerging. So how would you describe those themes and the common symptoms that go with them? BDD is a complex disorder, and there's multiple etiologies leading up to someone having BDD. It's never a clear cut. Uh, people present with very similar symptoms, but how they got to those symptoms is different. Um, commonalities would be compulsions. Uh, people with BDD do these behaviors, rituals, we call compulsions, in order to get relief from the distress and the shame they experience around the body part. Years of doing these compulsions, though, create an association between the feeling and the body part they don't like. So BDD builds on itself unless treated. Uh, a commonality I see with people with BDD is the family system. Always somehow, some way, BDD comes out of the family system. Sometimes it's really obvious, which would be coming from a family system that really emphasizes perfectionism, appearance, image. However, there's many people with BDD who come from family systems where body image or image in general is not emphasized, but always somehow, some way, BDD comes out of the family system. And that's not right or wrong. That's not good or bad. But that's a commonality I've seen over the years, too. Um, not unusual that people with BDD have experienced some sort of childhood trauma. It could be as overt as bullying. But I've worked with many people with BDD who was never bullied. People actually never comment on their appearance. But there's usually something there that actually happened or something that didn't happen or certain needs that didn't get met. So that's a commonality as well that I see with many, many, many people with BDD. How would you describe the way that those all of those factors contribute to make people feel? How does someone with BDD fundamentally feel within themselves? Shame is the root emotion behind BDD and deep shame. You know, people with BDD have a lot of other emotions, don't we all? Mm -hmm. So anxiety. Is BDD an anxiety disorder? No. But do people with BDD have anxiety and fear? Of course, right? And what that anxiety or and fear is ultimately is that they will be shamed or humiliated that they will be found out, you know, on a surface level, it's there's a lot of shame around that body part and fear associated with it. But the fear is that they will be exposed, shamed, humiliated, and ultimately rejected. Mm -hmm. Right. So shame is the root emotion. Um, close behind shame is guilt, loneliness, and it can be any other emotions. And there can be anger there as well. And with anger, people with BDD tend to be compassionate, empathic, caring individuals who don't express a lot of anger. People with BDD are internalizers versus externalizers. The externalizer is someone who blames everybody else or everything else. I am feeling bad because of you or this out there. People with BDD are the opposite of that. They're internalizers. I'm feeling bad because something is so wrong with me and there's nothing more concrete than blaming a feature of one's appearance because it's overt and concrete. I look at shame and guilt somewhat as cousins. They're moral emotions. Mm -hmm. So shame is the emotion that somehow there's something inherently defective about me. 
And guilt, I kind of call a cousin of shame, kind of shame light. Guilt is, I am doing something wrong to hurt others, but it's because of something's wrong with me is why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see a lot of shame. You're going to see loneliness, Mm -hmm. deep feelings of loneliness, guilt. But again, it can be any other emotion. So that shame component is essential to look at in in BDD recovery. Now, where does shame come from? If we look at shame as the emotion, as this experience that we're inherently defective, nobody is born feeling inherently defective. Nobody is born feeling they don't look attractive. Nobody's born feeling like a burden. Nobody's born feeling unlovable. Nobody's born feeling inherently defective. Nobody's born feeling less than. But somehow those messages get internalized, mm-hmm. right? And That's shame. And the shame gets put away in a very, very deep place. But with the emotion of shame, unless it's addressed, resolved, dislodged, the shame is still there. And shame will come out in maladaptive ways. And this is with anything. It doesn't have to just be BDD or body image disorders. You know, as humans, right, we're programmed to go away from pain, including emotional pain, and go towards less painful, go to comfort. Shame is a deep-rooted, painful emotion. So, so many of our behaviors, especially people with BDD, their behaviors and choices of behaviors are based on doing anything to hide that shame. But like anybody with unresolved shame, the problem is if the shame isn't worked through and processed, it's still there. And it will always come out in maladaptive ways. And with BDD, how does it come out? Through an aspect of the individual's appearance that they deem as profoundly defective. The shame and also something else you talked about, the loneliness um, struck me quite a lot because it reminded me that um, we had a chat before we spoke today that one of the things we talked about was that feeling of I'm different. You know, everyone else is normal and I'm over here. And the shame, I guess, is really tied up with that. How does that combination then play out in other areas of someone's life? Because I assume it doesn't just stop at the kind of BDD door. I imagine that if you're feeling that you're defective and different and you're full of shame about that, then that's going to play out in other ways. Correct. I mean, shame is that experience. There's something inherently wrong with me. Again, we're not born with shame. But if someone feels that inherently they're defective, it's also, I'm different. Mm -hmm. I'm different from others. And BDD itself is a very lonely diagnosis. The average person with BDD doesn't come out and talk about it. But if we talk about shame, and shame being one of the root emotions with BDD, people keep secrets around shame. Why? Because with shame, it's that feeling, if we are found out how bad I feel about myself or how disgusting or defective, no one will love me. In fact, I will be rejected. And with BDD, the greatest fear of people with BDD is rejection. Um, I I refer to it with my clients as the capital R word, Mm -hmm. rejection. Human beings are programmed not to be rejected. It's painful experience. But with BDD, it's to the next level. So if someone does not have a base of shame, someone does not have BDD, et cetera. No one likes rejection, but it ends as disappointment. For, but for someone with BDD, or it could be anybody with deep-rooted shame, it doesn't just have to be BDD, a rejection is more than a rejection. It is this evidence to the individual that's proof there's something so inherently defective mm-hmm. and wrong about me. So the shame sits there. And the shame then manifests. So the person keeps secrets, right? You keep secrets because I don't want anybody to find out what I feel is so inherently wrong with me. The problem is when we keep secrets, the shame sits there. And it will come out in maladaptive ways. One way could be BDD. But also in itself, then, if there's shame sitting there, inevitably, that is going to interfere with relationships, interpersonal and especially intimate relationships. You know, with intimate relationships, one has to make themselves vulnerable, right? I mean, that is intimacy. You have to make yourself vulnerable. However, if there's shame sitting there and you're hiding the shame, by definition, you can't make yourself vulnerable. Then how do you connect? And that leaves the individual 
feeling different, not connected, not lovable. Wait, why is it that I don't have an intimate relationship or why is it that people don't seem to like me? Right. It's easy then to go blame the body part. You see, it's my nose, it's my skin, it's my hair, it's my jaw, it's my teeth, so on and so forth. That's it. That's why I'm feeling lonely. That's why I don't have as many friends. That's why I don't have a significant other. It's easy to pin it on that. The problem with that, though, is the focus then goes on the body part again and again and again. But what gets missed there is what's underneath. And so that shame component in BDD recovery has to, it's essential that it's addressed and worked through. I always say that body dysmorphic disorder is a disorder of, of relationships, interpersonal and intimate relationships. And I always say this, you can't treat BDD without looking at interpersonal and intimate relationships. They go hand in hand. In fact, I'll go as far as to say BDD began in the context of relationships. So recovery from BDD has to occur within the context of relationships too. So the shame theme has to be addressed Mm -hmm. because BDD, another way we can conceptualize it is BDD is concretized shame on a body part. Mm -hmm. It's concretized shame on a body part. Yeah. Exactly. Or I presume also, do you see many people whose shame is kind of, it moves around the body and there's multiple body parts involved and it might, just depending on what's happening in, the, in that person's yeah. life or just generally yeah. in their self Absolutely. Mm. So with BDD, it can, a person could focus on one body part. They could focus on multiple. Usually there's a primary and a mm-hmm. secondary and tertiary. Um with people with BDD, vast majority, their main concern is from the neck up. I'm not saying that people with BDD couldn't have a preoccupation with a body part from the neck down, most from the neck up. I would say with my clients, probably a good 98 plus percent. Uh, most people with BDD have a primary and a lot have a secondary or, or tertiary, et cetera. And also it can jump around so if someone let's say they're preoccupied with their facial skin and all of a sudden their facial skin they believe starts looking better it could jump to their hair or their nose now why is that right how does it jump around well there isn't a bodily concrete solution to an emotional issue so if all of a sudden they become less dissatisfied with one area if the emotional material and shame hasn't been resolved, it's going to jump. Um, this is another reason why cosmetic procedures do not work with untreated BDD. Because even the most precise, experienced cosmetic surgeon, they're operating on the concrete body. They're not operating on emotional material. So someone gets a cosmetic procedure, on the rare occasion, they're happy with it. Most of the time, they're not. Most of the time, it's just a a matter of time until they become dissatisfied again. But on the rare occasion, they are satisfied with the change of that body part. And this is untreated BDD. It just jumps to another body part because at the end of the day, right, there's something sitting underneath. And that's really, really deep rooted shame. And, and, And taking it back to the loneliness factor, too, we were talking about loneliness BDD itself is a lonely disorder. But when we're talking about shame, because people keep it secrets and they don't want people to find out, they're in this deeply lonely world, feeling nobody understands them, nobody could understand me, and I must be the only one having this experience. So the shame keeps the person in the place of loneliness. Something I see all the time, too, with individuals with BDD is often when they're feeling lonely, because all of us as as humans have loneliness. That in itself is a human emotion. Individuals with BDD, often when they're feeling lonely, is when it's almost an automated response to going to the body part they deem as defective. I'm feeling this way. It must be this, this, or this feature. Why? And if this feature looked different... I wouldn't feel as lonely. That's why the shame component, again, I can't emphasize this more, is such an essential part of treatment working through that 
because shame keeps people lonely and disconnected, which then plays into the theme that we talked about earlier about inherently feeling defective and different. And even people with BDD, right? Even people with the same body part, right? BDD concern can even feel different from that other person. Well, we have the same body part that we have BDD around, but I still feel different from you. And that go, again, goes back to the shame component. I'll move on pretty soon about asking you about how you go about treating BTD and getting people to addressing things like the shame issue and identity and so on. But I just wanted to go back to something you were saying when you talked about what happens in childhood. And it was actually what you were saying about what, what doesn't happen sometimes. Can you tell me a little bit more about that kind of trauma? Sure. Let me, let me begin by saying um, I do not come from a place of fault or blame. Why? Fault or blame would insinuate that somebody intentionally did something. Um, something that's been well established with those of us who work with trauma is that trauma gets passed on intergenerationally. What does that mean? It means that unless trauma is resolved, it gets passed on to the next generation. And they land in treatment for a diagnosis. You name the diagnosis. So, you know, when we think of traumas that, and this, this information is becoming much more widespread, which is an advantage of social media. There's pros and cons of social media. You know, trauma does not just mean someone who came out of a war zone or had a car accident. Trauma is any unresolved material. You know, when we think of traumas, it's something that did happen. Okay, those are obvious. Those are traumas that have to be addressed. But what gets ironically neglected often is what didn't happen. Um, I refer to it as emotional developmental trauma. We could call it emotional neglect. There's different terms, but it's what didn't happen. And, and this is a theme I see with so many people with BDD. Some people with BDD have had overt traumas in childhood. Those have to be addressed like anybody. And there's many, many people who don't have BDD of other diagnoses diagnoses that have trauma in childhood. So this isn't just a BDD theme. But a theme I see with many people with BDD is emotional developmental trauma is that somewhere early on in their childhood, there were some emotional needs not met. And what's interesting about this is if you don't know you needed something, then how do you know that it even exists? So if someone came and started working with me and said, this concretely happened to me growing up, like in kindergarten, I was bullied on the playground. That's concrete. They can bring that in, right? And that's important because we have to address that. But it's what didn't happen, which no one ever brings into treatment, right? Because you don't know it happened. And the irony of all this is, Emotional developmental trauma is one of the most neglected traumas addressed in therapy. Um, the reason why I always ask about it is because I know it's a commonality with people with BDD. And again, if you don't know something's missing, then how do you know? Often how it presents itself with people, and again, this can be individuals without BDD. This can be a lot of different diagnoses, but it often presents as a really deep, lonely, empty internal experience that's hard to put one's finger on, right? That something early on was missing emotionally. Um, and it can be a variety of things. For instance, let's say someone came from a very loving family where all their at least concrete needs were met. But let's say, for instance, a parent who early in their life had some sort of trauma and feels very uncomfortable around those emotions that we don't like. And call it what it is, vast majority of emotions humans don't like. There's a handful we like, most we don't like. It, it goes back to basic evolution and survival. But let's say somebody grows up in a household with a parent or parents who are uncomfortable with, with negative emotions, uncomfortable emotions, and only kind of permit, we only talk about or we only express the good emotions. What happens there is humans have this whole continuum of emotions. So if the child never learns what to do with these uncomfortable emotions, the issue is they still have them. Mm. But no one taught them what to do with them. 
The problem is then when they enter the world and they have these feelings, what are they going to do? And they're going to start trying to solve them. And people with BDD try to solve these uncomfortable emotions through a body part, which has never been done. Mm -hmm. So with emotional violence and trauma, it's what didn't happen, not just what did happen. And that has to be addressed too. Is it everybody with BDD? Of course not. Is it many, many people with BDD? Yes. And this also, with, with any sort of childhood trauma, it plays into the identity theme. Mm. And when treating BDD, the theme of identity and development has to be addressed. And this is what separates body image dissatisfaction versus a, a severe body image disorder like BDD. With body image dissatisfaction, one's identity isn't built around a body part. With people with BDD, there's been disruption in their identity development. And so this is where shame occurs. If shame comes from childhood trauma, including what didn't happen, so if there's shame from an early age, the problem is the basis of one's identity foundation and formation is ridden with shame. And when there's shame sitting there, obviously that feeling is I must do anything to get not have this feeling. So then the individual starts doing one of three things. They start trying to please, appease, or perform. They start learning, I have to do something externally in my life in order to not feel this feeling like something's wrong with me. So their identity starts being founded around either trying to please people, appease people, or perform, meaning their identity is built through outside in, external. Mm -hmm. What's the problem with that? If identity is built from external things, you never develop internal. And this is going to be a theme with everybody with BD to different degrees, right? All this exists on a continuum. I've yet to work with someone with BDD who enters treatment with BDD who has a, a quite integrated sense of self, mm -hmm. right? They may have someone with a quite integrated sense of self could have body image dissatisfaction, but they're not going to have a body image disorder. So shame interferes with a healthy integration of identity. And when someone does not, didn't have the opportunity to develop, develop an integrated sense of self, we can also call it capital S self. That means they keep going to the external to try to figure out who they are. And with BDD, where do they go? Whatever said feature on their body. This is why I'm not good enough. This is why I'm feeling lonely. This is why I'm single. Mm -hmm. And again, it leaves them lonely. The, the irony about BDD is BDD is the ultimate form of critical self-judgment when you think about it. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate form of critical self-judgment. And the person begins then shaming themselves. So it's this feedback loop where there was shame sitting there as a basis of their identity formation and foundation, but then they become the biggest self-critic judgmental people of all, which is themselves shaming themselves. Do they then continue with whatever the pattern was, appease, perform, please? Or do they keep continue acting that out then through their adult lives as a way of escaping the shame? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you're always doing something to please, appease, or perform for others, you're never developing mm. who you are, and that's not fault. But it needs to be addressed. Obviously, if people knew otherwise and knew how to do it, they would do it. But that's why all these factors when treating BDD have to be addressed simultaneously because, yeah, the person's life is based on trying to do something external with BDD. It's often around the uh, cosmetic feature, aesthetic feature. But then by definition, they never have the opportunity to build inside out. Yeah, no, exactly. How do you then go about treating people? I mean, what, what, what are the approaches that you found to be effective? I think... To summarize, flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, BDD is a very rigid, absolute, and flexible disorder. Mm -hmm. So as a clinician who works with BDD, I have to be flexible. People with BDD present with very similar symptoms, 
how they got to those symptoms is different. So if I came in and said, this is the treatment modality for BDD and this is what we're going to do. And this is cookie cutter. And we're going to put this on everybody. Well, I am actually ready mimic the mimicking the inflexibility of BDD. So I have to be flexible. So one BDD client I work with may need more of this or that modality where another one might need more of this. So I think overall it's, I have to be flexible because if I'm not, I'm mimicking the inflexibility of BDD. Yeah. What then would be, say, for example, with the identity building um, side of things, what would be um, a way that you would approach that? It's a really great question. So obviously everybody comes in for symptoms. For anyone who has BDD or has worked with BDD, it's a tormenting, distressing disorder. There's just no argument about that. So anybody who comes in who wants symptom reduction, who wouldn't? Who wants to suffer? And people with BDD, they suffer. So there has to be symptom reduction, and we can talk about what that looks like. Of course, something I always say is BDD recovery begins once BDD symptoms have been reduced. That's when treatment begins. When one is suffering with symptoms, we're not going to be focusing on, okay, now we have to fix your identity. Well, the person's suffering. Another aspect of treatment and the flexibility is, is putting different things together at the same time. So obviously we have to look at symptoms, but if we're only looking at symptoms, how do we start building the other areas? So in BDD recovery, the longer term work is identity building. It's not, it's not okay, we've done this and we're going to build your identity in two months. Like identity doesn't work that way. Identity forms throughout a lifetime. What I also see is identity development can actually occur rather quickly when people start resolving a lot of the shame. And when the shame is resolved, that improves and increases their interpersonal and intimate interactions, right? <clears throat> so with identity building, it's a two-way street. It can't just be by external things, but we can't do it in a, in a vacuum in a bubble, Right. We need mirroring from other people. So it has to include humans. So human interaction is a essential part of identity building. So it comes from getting feedback from other people, but also internally doing uncomfortable things, right? It can't be one or the other. So it entails both. So if someone has severe BDD symptoms and they're not interacting with people, well, that's where BDD wants them. BDD wants them isolated, and that's where BDD thrives when they're in isolation. So we have to get the individual to a point where they're interacting with people. So that's why the symptom reduction obviously is important. People with BDD have avoided personalities to different degrees. And it fits, right? Well, something is so wrong with how I look, I don't want anybody to see me. But again, that's where BDD thrives. But if we don't have interaction with other people, then how do we get feedback? How do we get emotional mirroring? How do we get emotional attunement? We can't. So treatment of BDD entails people, but uh, it can't just be people. It has to be going into uncomfortable things. For, for any of us humans, the only way we really grow is to do uncomfortable things, mm -hmm. right? Because what we do is when we, we, we work through uncomfortable situations, we learn, A, it's not as dangerous, anxiety-provoking as we thought, but it also, that's what builds sense of self. It's coming out the other side and realizing, wait, I did this. Mm -hmm. So building identity comes from, A, the personal ability going into uncomfortable situations. And how they do that, I would, I would recommend they talk to their therapist about it. Because if they go in uncomfortable situations, but they're not processing the emotions that come up, it's likely then the reactions to the negative emotions will play out their BDD compulsion. So for any of those people with BDD in their own therapy hearing this, I would really plan out with your psychotherapist what that's going to look like so the two of you can process the emotions that come up, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like with any, we can also call it behavioral therapy. And behavioral therapy to me is a very broad spectrum, but... 
regardless of what behavioral change, the person would be has to do things that are uncomfortable in order to work through those feelings. And really, when they come out the other side, that's what builds self. Yeah. So like the whole flexibility thing we've been talking about, yes, you have to build within by doing uncomfortable things, but you can't do it in a bubble. You have to do it in the context of people. And so the work I do with people, it always comes down to humans. It always comes down to people, right? It can't come down to just, we're going to do this one modality and that's it. The general theme is BDD has to occur within the context of, of other people and identity building has to occur within the context of other people. And here's the good news. It may take, you know, one could be in their 30s, 40s, 50s. I'm working with someone in the late 50s now who it's the first time they've been in treatment for BDD. Their identity building got stunted when they were younger. But I actually see this person in their late 50s building their own identity. You can build it at any age. There's not like a cutoff. There isn't this, well, you're 18 and it's over. You can never build your identity. But once you get unstuck, and unstuck isn't just reducing the BDD symptoms. Unstuck is working through that shame. So you can actually evolve emotionally. That's when the identity at any age starts to really build. Mm. And that's, that's the good news. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very encouraging. Um, what about the actual shame aspect then? Um, how might you go about helping someone to overcome that? So the, and this is where everything fits together. Mm. On a surface BDD diagnosis level, it's because of said body part is why I can't be loved or I'm lonely or I don't have friends or you name it. So again... That's why it's important to reduce overt symptoms. A good place to start with shame is in the confidentiality, in the, in the the space of confidentiality in one's own individual therapy. And you don't have to be working with a quote unquote BDD specialist or expert to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone's available where you live, that's helpful. But shame occurs with with all diagnoses. So even if you don't have a BDD expert in your particular area that you live, working with just a very seasoned, experienced psychotherapist or a therapist that works with shame, because regardless of the diagnosis, it has to be worked through. And and people don't talk about shame, as we said before, because the feeling if anybody found out about me, what I think is so wrong with me, inevitably I'll be rejected. So a good place to start is in the confidentiality, safe space of therapy. And there isn't this secret formula. Mm -hmm. It's you start working through shame by sharing with another human being what you think is so wrong. Mm -hmm. So that is the starting point. You know, the interesting thing about the emotion of shame is when someone's having shame, it feels like everybody else must know. When actually nobody else knows you're having shame, but it feels like everybody else must know. So a safe place to start is in one's own psychotherapy. And again, it doesn't have to be a BDD expert. And I just want to clarify something here. When I use the term psychotherapy, what that means when I use that term is it's uh, somebody who goes into treatment for any disorder, not just BDD, regardless of the therapeutic modality, right? In order to reduce symptoms and to get unstuck. So when I use psychotherapy as a term, it could be any modality. It could be EMDR, it could be CBT, it could be ACT TAG, it could be internal family systems, you name it. So psychotherapy to me is any modality or modalities that are used to get someone unstuck and to reduce symptoms. Great. Um, and actually, you reminded me there of internal family systems. that I was talking to someone the other day who's just started having therapy based on that in the UK. And it was quite a new thing to me that I hadn't heard about. But you were chatting earlier about the family system as being quite foundational in forming BDD and contributing to someone developing BDD. So could you tell us a little bit about what the, psych- the internal family system psychotherapy looks like, how that works? Sure. Again, with treating BDD, There isn't one fixed way to do it. There are some things that are preferable 
that I'd recommend. Mm. But I don't want people to think that, oh, you have to follow this mm -hmm. because you have to actually adapt to the individual. Something, a modality that I like to utilize is internal family systems, IFS. But again, there may be some clients that it, it doesn't adapt well to, mm -hmm. or I don't use with certain individuals, but it's one I like to use because IFS has been around a long time. And it's interesting because when we look at Western medicine or Western psychiatry, it's very monolithic and linear. You have a diagnosis, you're broken. And unless we fix you, you're broken. There's nothing in between. And when you think about BD, that is also so rigid. My said body part is ugly or broken. And unless it's 100% fixed, I'm bad. The theme around internally family systems is that you're not made up of one part. It's not that linear. It's not you're broken or fixed. That we're made up of many different parts, which I think in Western medic uh, psychiatry, they're really scared to say multiple parts. Mm -hmm. In IFS, we have many parts to us. We're not just here or there. And in internal and family systems, that there are no bad parts. Whereas if we look at it from a very Western perspective, it's you have a diagnosis, you're broken. We have to get rid of it for you're fixed. So internal family system comes from this place of there are no bad parts. So even with diagnoses, I think anybody would agree that if someone is suffering from a diagnosis, well, that's not a good experience. But internal family systems is saying that the diagnosis, which are symptoms, actually isn't a bad thing. It's there for a reason. It's not a bad part. And to say it's a bad part would be saying there's a part of you that's bad. Well, there's not a bad part of you. But if we say you have this diagnosis, we have to get rid of it, that there's a bad part of you. So no one's saying in IFS that the symptoms shouldn't be reduced. Okay, we don't want someone to suffer. But it's looking at the bigger picture, looking at someone from multiple parts, and that a person can create their own internal family system that they create. And coming from a place of none of my internal parts are bad. It's just that we have to shift these parts because there's some internal conflict that's playing out. And in the case of BDD, it's playing out through a body part. So I personally really like to utilize IFS with BDD because also with internal family systems, it's about building what they call the capital S self, leading with the capital S self, right? Which anybody coming into the treatment with a symptom is not, not leading with capital S self. So it's so identity oriented. Mm -hmm. And since BDD is such a disorder around identity, that's why I like utilizing internal family systems. But again, I just want to reiterate, that isn't the only way to do it. I like doing that. Um, I also like doing a lot of behavioral therapy. I come from the approach of inside out and outside in. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, in actual the therapy settings, there's a lot of emotional material that's ad addressed and needs to be resolved. Very important. But there has to be some behavioral changes too, right? Without behavioral changes, how are you going to reroute neural pathways? If we only do behavioral work, okay, that's important, but then the internal material can never actually be resolved. So behavioral work by itself, it's important. But the problem is it can bring up a lot of emotions that if not addressed can lead back into shame. At the same time, if we only do the internal work, and I look at the internal work as the work in actual therapy sessions, it could be internal family systems, it could be any other modality. How do we make changes and unlearning of those neurobiological pathways? So again, with the whole theme of flexibility, we have to do both at the same time. So I'm a big believer in behavioral therapies, and there's different different behavioral therapies, some more suited to BDD than others. I like utilizing IFS, but I think at the end of the day, Claire, the main theme, regardless of, of the modality, is BDD recovery has to entail people, regardless of what modality a therapist utilizes. Mm, yeah. So given what you've said, Ari, about how many different ways you may choose to approach a patient and help someone who's got BDD, how do you then know if they're starting to get better? What are the signs for you that someone's making good progress? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. So on the surface would be, okay, a decrease in symptoms. Like, 
Of course. Mm-hmm. Like someone comes in suffering and tormented, it's really nice for them and nice to see them getting some relief. But ultimately, I measure BDD recovery on the improved quality of relationships. Mm-hmm. BDD takes away relationships. If you're having a relationship with a body part, there's less room for a human being. But if you're having less of a relationship with a body part, guess what? There's more room for human beings. So I measure it in terms of the change and quality and improvement in interpersonal intimate relationships. That's how I measure BDD recovery. Mm. Does that mean then that you might see someone who's because of that cycle of the shame and the loneliness and the identity issues all sort of scrambled up together. Do you see people who've kept themselves isolated from intimate relationships for many, many years, then actually go on and date and be quite um, in the world in that sense, like have um, intimate relationships with people? Is, is that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that is being you. It's different yeah. for everybody based on their histories, right? Mm-hmm. But for someone who's maybe been isolated for years, the change might be just starting with very casual acquaintance in our personal relationships. It wouldn't be jumping in mm. to deep intimate relations, yeah. but let's say there's someone BDD who, who has friends, has good interpersonal relationships, but it's the intimate mm. department, which is more difficult. Okay. We'll, we'll fade into that. So it is case by case, mm. but regardless of intimate or interpersonal, yeah, ultimately we all need people. Mm-hmm. It's built into our DNA. We need to connect. Yeah. And BDD takes that away. And when BDD takes that away, that will leave a human being feeling inherently, I am so different from everybody else. Mm-hmm. And in BDD, oh, it's my said body part. Why? Mm-hmm. So BDD recovery is about humans. It's about relationships. It's about connections. And again, really depending on the person's background and where they are when they come into treatment, and it's on a continuum. We'll determine where we go with that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I I know someone's getting better when they have improved relationships with others. More relationships, more quality relationships. They have less social anxiety. I mean, BDD and social anxiety usually go hand in hand. That's when I know they're recovering. Mm-hmm. Because people with BDD, you know, there's there's a lot of fear around relationships. Maybe not on the surface, but If that inherent sense of being defective, that shame is sitting there and you don't really believe you fit in anywhere, I mean, how can't that interfere with what we all need, which is human connection and love? I mean, that's built in our DNA. But if that's interfered with by shame and the presentation of BDD, then of course you're going to be left feeling inherently defective. It's such a cruel disorder, isn't it? BDD. It's, it's really, it's very, very uh, debilitating, or can be very debilitating, can't it? BDD is cruel, yeah. taking away our most human need, what we evolved to have, which is human connection. Mm-hmm. That's cruel. BDD is cruel. However, people with BDD can get a lot, lot better. And as I was just saying, I measure it not just in reduction of symptoms, but when I see an improvement in their relationships with people. Mm, yeah. That's regardless of the modality you use. Mm. Um, one final thing I always like to ask people is, um, and I ask people in when we do recovery stories, but it applies to you too, is that what advice would you give or words of sort of comfort would you give, I guess, to someone who's really in the throes of uh, the worst that BDD can, uh, can throw at a person? And this, and we touched upon a few things earlier where you talked about things you could discuss with your therapist, but um, I just wondered if there's anything else you would want to say. Trust. So when one has either interrupted interpersonal intimate relationship early in their life or in general when there's a lot of shame sitting there, like how do we trust people? Like one of the first casualties of shame is trust. Right. Mm -hmm. And nobody with BDD can solve it themselves. Everybody with BDD tries and everybody with BDD tries to solve their material through their body part. It's never been done. It never will be done. I'll reiterate, you can't solve emotional issues through a body part. Even though everybody with BDD tries, that's why it's BDD. Mm -hmm. There has to be trust. But if trust goes early in one's life 
because of the shame, right? Then how do we connect? Um, as psychotherapists, I'm a psychotherapist. We're human. Do I have all the answers? No. Am I imperfect? Absolutely. I'm imperfect. Right. However, you need to trust your psychotherapist. BDD is really sneaky. BDD is really powerful, right? And BDD is going to send you these messages that it's your body part. That's why you're single. That's why you're lonely. That's why you don't have interpersonal interactions. This is my problem. BDD will send you those messages. That's BDD's job. And I, I want to say something I forgot to say earlier. BDD's sole job is to separate the BDD sufferer from other people. That's its job. Because BDD has a lot of traction and does its best when you're lonely and by yourself. Where trust fits in is this. You need to trust the psychotherapist, the clinician you're working with. Again, they don't have all the answers. None of us do. But you've been trusting BDD for maybe your whole life or at least for a long time. And where has it gotten you? Well, worse symptoms. So are you going to continue trusting BDD? You need to actually make it fair at least and trust the person who you're working with who has a much more objective perspective, which you can't have if you have BDD. Is it hard to trust, especially if trust has been broken early in your life? Of course. But I would say you have to start trusting because you need to listen to someone else who has a much more objective point of view than, than your BDD. So yeah, capital T trust. Fantastic. It's a great note to end with. Thank you so much, Ari. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate your time, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to Ari for joining us to talk about his experience of working with people with BTD. For more episodes, search for Beating BTD wherever you get your podcasts. You can also leave us feedback by following the BTD Foundation on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook. I'll be back with another interview as soon as I can. Until then, remember that this podcast isn't therapy, so please do seek help from a trained professional. Thanks for listening.